Thank you all for coming back this week. Glory to God. We're back for another Sabbath day. Amen. Amen. I want to start with a reading tonight. I wasn't planning on reading this tonight. This happened to turn to it. I mean, it kind of falls into what I'll be studying tonight with you guys. So turn your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 2. Zephaniah chapter 2. We have some new folks here tonight. We just want to stand up for a second. If you don't mind, I don't want to embarrass you. But just stand up just for a second, please. If it's your first night here. Matthew? Yeah. Welcome, Matthew. Yeah. Give a hand clap for Matthew. Yeah. And what was your name? I'm sorry. Jesse. Jesse and Edie. Edie. Thank you. Beverly. Beverly? Beverly. Beverly, okay. Thank you for coming. All right, you turn your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 2. Zephaniah is kind of a hard one to find. It's not real long. It's one of the prophets. Zephaniah chapter 2. If you need a Bible, there's some Bibles in the back room here by that door. There's a whole bunch of Bibles in that case over there if you need a Bible. We've got many of them. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse number 1. It says, Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation. Before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth. Everybody who's been oppressed, all the meek of the earth, seek the Lord, who have upheld his justice, its righteousness. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Amen? So when the Lord returns, and those that are His, we're going to be bold and lift our hands up. Amen? Amen. That's what He wants us. Amen. You know what? I don't have a title for this week yet, but the word I was given this week, me and Cody have been preaching here for about six years, and God has been faithful. Every single week for six years, we've been given dreams for words to preach on, scriptures, and we've never preached anything on our own, ever, which I'm thankful. I couldn't pick out the right scriptures anyway, and I'm thankful God does that. The one he gave me this week was justice over mercy, withhold from me, and I will withhold from you. And on Wednesday morning, I got up and I got the word moral turpitude, which anyway, I'm going to describe what justice is. It's not the same thing as judgment. You know, everybody knows mercy over judgment. Yes, triumphs over judgment. But I'm talking about justice. Our justice is a principle of righteousness and equity controlling our conduct and securing a due regard to all the rights of others. Persons, property, character, and interest. All right? And it has to do with your relationship with society, okay? So all of us will have, all of us want to see justice, right? Right? Let me just start with this right here. It's rendered to everyone that which is due them. All right? And so it means doing the right thing when no one's watching, right? Have you guys ever sat on a jury? Have you guys ever sat on a jury? Okay. This is the way that I wanted to describe it this week, too. I'd make it easier. Get you going on it. So if you go to court, right? <clears throat> You get arrested, you go to court, but say you're arrested for manslaughter. The term for manslaughter is, it's a misdemeanor, you can either get one two years, four years, or six years, right? If you're convicted. I'm just kind of giving you an analogy. And there's add-ons, if you're intoxicated, in case you take off, whatever else, all these add-ons can be put on there. But everybody wants what from the court? Mercy. They want mercy of the court, right? All right, what if you're the victim's family? What do you want? Justice. You want justice, right? You want justice, right? Yeah. Right? Okay, the verdict is the judgment. And it comes back either guilty or not guilty. And in the Lord's terms, it's either righteous or unrighteous. Amen? Amen. And so justice, what it means is the penalty. Justice is the penalty that's going to be measured against somebody, right? And think about Christ for the penalty. He suffered on the cross for us. And that was the penalty. But we can never, ever understand mercy if we don't understand the penalty. We have, to un we have to understand first what the penalty is. And think of it like this. It's consequences. It's correction. And, of course, all the victims want the full extent of the law. And, of course, <laughs> compassion, love. Everybody wants that, right? 
But all of this starts in your homes when kids are little, right? Yes. And if little kids get away with stuff over and over and over, when you always show them mercy, what happens? Mm -hmm. Their entire life, they want mercy and there's never any justice, mm -hmm. right? That's an issue. And right now in the United States, everybody wants justice. I want justice. I want justice. But are you at the same time giving out justice in your life? You know what I mean? Are you fair and impartial? I mean, think about a referee man, or an umpire during a baseball game. And everybody's freaked out about the umpire calling balls and structure. I've done that before. You know, people over here cussing at you, people over here cussing at you for every single ball and every single strike they're mad about, right? So think about that for a second. And so justice, it's the penalty, it's the punishment. In the Strongs, it's 1343, and what it means is, and what is approved in the Lord's eyes, and deemed right by God, amen? So justice is a measure given after judgment, amen? So you guys hang on to that just for a second. I covered a little bit of that. Here several years ago, I worked for the Sheriff's Department for 22 years as a deputy sheriff here in Bakersfield, Wasco, and Cottonwood, and Oildale. Uh, and for those folks who don't know me. Uh, but one night I had a call, and this lady was pregnant. She was about six months pregnant. Her and her husband were newlyweds, and he was barbecuing outside. And she got upset, and one of those big old forks that you see for cooking with, and she ran that through his fork. So when I got there, he's standing out there, with those big old giant forks ran through his arm. And his, uh, he didn't want nothing done, but his mom had called. And I showed up, and her dad showed up, and they're all, hey man, just be merciful with her. She's six months pregnant, and I'm like, I have to make an arrest on this. I shall make an arrest for domestic violence, whether or not she meant to do it or not. Being pregnant doesn't get you out of it. And of course, her husband, or not her husband, but her dad pulled out a card. Well, I'm a lieutenant at Wasco Prison. I go, that means absolutely nothing to me. She's going to jail. So she went to jail. But we have to be impartial with our decision. And so many times we're not impartial with decisions, with family, with friends. We overlook a lot of stuff, don't we? We don't call people out one. Well, I don't want to offend them. But in God's eyes, is that right? No. We're supposed to be truthful with everybody. we got to be truthful. But you can do it in a gentle way. You can. But there's some people who have never learned and what justice truly is. And they only want justice when they're on the other end of it, right? Turn your Bibles to, uh, to Deuteronomy 16 20. Deuteronomy 16 20. Deuteronomy 16 20. And what mercy means is uh, a commitment. Like compassion or love for somebody. It means compassion. Everybody loves mercy. We all love mercy. But mercy has its proper place as well. Deuteronomy 16, 20, it says, Do not deny justice or show partiality. Did you hear that? Don't show partiality for someone. What's well, my sister? I want to let her off. No. Be honest with everybody, because you're not helping them by lying to them. All you're doing, man, is enabling somebody for something to get worse and worse and worse. I mean, think of an addict. Now, all of us here know an addict or a drink or pills or whatever. You never help someone who's an addict by saying, oh, man, don't worry about it. Keep doing it, right? That doesn't work, does it? Somebody has to confront them and say, listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You need to get in a program, right? We have to do that. We have to be honest with those that we love. We've got to be honest. We can't lie to them and just pat them on the back and pet their devils. We can't do that. And so Deuteronomy 16, 20, 19, and 20. It says, do not deny justice or show partiality. And do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Verse 20 says, pursue justice and justice alone, so that you may live and you may possess the land that the Lord and your God is giving you. So it's very important in your life not to be partial to certain people. Yes, you can love them, but not to a fault. We can love people to a fault. Would you guys agree? Yeah. I've been married 30 years. What about you guys? Been married a long time? I've been married 30 years. And sometimes it's tough. We give and we take, don't we? And some days are tougher than other days. But at the same time, we still hold each other accountable. We have to. 
We have to live a life like that. Psalm 99. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 99. Psalm 99. If you don't have a Bible, we'll get you one. Psalm 99. So our focus tonight is justice and mercy. Is our focus. Psalm 99. Verse 1. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. Verse 2. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the peoples. Verse 3. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Verse 4. The king's strength also loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Right? Do you believe when the Lord returns it's going to be just and he returns? That everybody's going to be judged righteously? Would you? Yeah. All right. It's when the Lord parts the clouds and all those people who were living in their sin but never repented or actually acknowledged God, what's going to happen to them? The wrath of God abides on them. That's the truth. The wrath of God abides on those who don't believe in Jesus. And they could be your best friend, but you need to tell them the truth. And there is a place of torment called hell, and hell gets thrown into the lake of fire. We either accept or reject Jesus, one of the two. We can't be on both sides playing that card. We've got to tell them the truth. Amen? Or turn your Bibles to Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter. Jude chapter 1. It's right before Revelation. So what we're talking about tonight is justice over mercy. Not judgment, but justice. And what it means is a penalty. It's an actual penalty. And all of us have got speeding tickets, right? Did you deserve it? Most of us, yes. We deserve the ticket. A lot of times we deny it. I wasn't speeding. And all these reasons... But the good thing about a speeding ticket, it's called the spirit of the law. They don't have to write you a ticket. They don't have to. It's called the spirit of the law. They may write you a ticket. Huh? <laughs> but it all depends on your attitude. <laughs> if you have a really bad attitude, you'll probably get a ticket. So Jude 1.7. Jude 1.7. It says, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, having indulged in sexual immorality... And having gone after strange flesh in like manner with them, are set forth as an example, undergoing the penalty of eternal fire. So Sodom and Gomorrah was crushed and burned by fire, right? And they had all kinds of stuff going on with men with men, women with women. And the angels showed up. They wanted to sleep with the angels. You guys remember that? Yeah. Lot goes into his house with the angels. And he invites his son-in-laws, his wife, his daughters to leave with him. His son-in-law stayed. They didn't go with him. They take off, and the angel walks them out of town by hand. The Bible says he walks them out by their hands to get them out of town. And, of course, the wife still turns around. Still turns around and looks back at her past. And so many times, a lot of us know the Lord's coming back with judgment and wrath, but we don't change our ways. We don't change. If Christ is truly living in you, it's a byproduct of the fruit of Christ, the grace that he gives you, the power to turn away from stuff. Your life will be different. You can't fake it. Either Christ is living in you or he's not. Amen? But that's the power of Christ. You're going to have a thirst and a love for Jesus unlike anything else. Amen? And yes, it's amazing. The grace of God, the love of God is amazing. But it's a two-sided coin. A lot of people won't tell you the two-sided coin. I'm going to share some. Scriptures here as well. Right, turn your Bibles to Matthew 23. I've got a few verses there. Matthew 23. We're going to talk about the Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew 23, verse 23. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay a tithe of mint and anias and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice and mercy and faith. And see, these Pharisees, man, depending on who they knew, who they were friends with, the rich or whoever else, they got certain favors. But on the outside, man, they were. I mean, they looked like they were somebody else, but inside they were devils. And so Jesus is there cracking down on them. 
He's telling the truth. But he says, you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving others undone. You're blind guides who straighten out a nap and swallow a camel. Do you hear that? And so the Lord wants from us, and we're always like saying, our judges need to be doing this. Our, our teachers need to be doing this. Our police officers need to be doing this. One day they grew up in somebody's house, right? You started in somebody's house and somebody brought you up. You can't go back and go, well, my child will do it. Well, now you're 25. You have to take responsibility for yourself. All of us do. Accountability, ownership, responsibility is huge. Most people don't like those words. Ownership of your actions, right? Consequences of your actions, right? That's right. Ownership. It is something that's gone by the wayside. I kid you not. I don't see a lot of ownership with a lot of people. Even if something's going on and they're flat out like in a bad place, they'll still make an excuse. Stop making excuses. I don't respect anybody that makes excuses. And admit, say, you don't want to screw it up. I can deal with that. I'll love you, hug on you, man. We'll work it out. But if you come up and start making excuses, I don't want to hear it. And you're telling me that God's not strong enough to deal with it. That's all you're telling me. But anyway, Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56, 1. It says, Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Did you hear that? He says to keep justice. That's in everything you do. Keep justice. Keep justice. And yes, as parents, and we're grandparents, all of our kids are grown up. But as parents, we need to be good examples for our kids, do we not? We need to be a good example to our children. In everything we do, in our speech, our walk, our talk, our lives, we need to be a good example, right? Because if you're going to hold them accountable for something, then you better be holding yourself accountable as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's look at uh, Psalm 89. Turn your Bibles there for a second. Psalm 89, 14. I know I'm kind of going through this fast. I'm excited. I'm passionate about this. <laughs> Psalm 89, 14. Psalm 89, 14. It's a really important verse right here. Really think about this when I read it. I'm going to read it slow for you. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Who's he talking about there? God. Righteousness and justice, that's the foundation of God's throne. He's a just God. He sees everybody, does he not? He sees everything we do. And yes, he will judge us accordingly. If you're talking too much about judgment, yes, I am. There will come a day of judgment. There will. And there's people who will deny Christ. And there's people in the Bible who have their names blotted out in the book of life. They've been removed. They were once in the book of life. Read in Revelations. And they got removed. Why? They turned away from God and walked away from him. Right. It happens. Look at Judas. He walked with the best preacher that ever lived. And he walked away from him for money. For 30 shekels of silver. What's worth your soul, man? What is worth it? Nothing. Amen. Psalm 89, 14, one more time. Righteousness and, just, and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Amen? Amen. Let's look at Proverbs 21. Let's look at Proverbs 21. I'm going to start with verse number 1. Proverbs 21. It says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. Verse number 2. This is really good. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. Did you hear that? Every way of a man, including a woman as well, is right in their own eyes. Right? And a lot of times you can't persuade someone else to do something different. You're like, you're going down the wrong road. You guys ever see the movie with... Uh, Steve Martin. Steve Martin. <laughs> Was it John Candy? I think so. Is it John Candy? Yeah, they're inside of a car and they're going the wrong way. Oh, crazy, crazy. Yeah. And they're going the wrong way on the wrong side of the freeway. And people are yelling, you're going the wrong way. And they go, man, they don't know where we're going. How do they know we're going the wrong way? Well, all of a sudden, here comes a couple of diesels. And they go between it and tears the side of the car off. But that's the thing. As brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ, it says in Matthew 7, first pull the plank out of your own eye, then you can go help your brother, right? There's nothing wrong with sharing the truth with a sister or a brother because you love them. 
I mean, don't bring them a sugar-coated gospel that's never going to save them. I've seen more people that come from these streets around here that are gangsters who come to Jesus when you tell them the truth. And if I go up and start sugarcoating, they laugh and think it's funny. But if you come and tell them the truth, they're loyal to Jesus, man. They get changed. Amen. But that's the thing. You can't lie to people, man. You've got to share the, you got to share the gospel here in the Bible. That's right. Amen? Yeah. Cool. Amen. That was verse 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. Verse 3, to do righteousness and justice. Amen? Is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Amen? So righteousness and justice. Turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians 1. 2 Thessalonians 1. I'm going to start at verse number 3. It says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. And the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. Verse 4. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all the persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Verse 5. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. And so he's talking about the judgment that's coming back. And for which, and you also suffer. A lot of people will suffer, man, for sharing the true message of God. Christ was killed for his message. All the disciples were killed for their message. They were murdered for it. Uh, where did I stop at? Verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Verse 7. I'm trying to get to some verses, but I want to read it in context. Verse 7. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. For all those who deny God, what's going to happen to them? Well, I don't want to tell somebody that. It might upset them. Really? Do you love them? Do you care? And I'm talking about eternity here. It's a long time. And this life is short. It's just a vapor. And keep listening. In flaming fire, and taking vengeance on those who do not know God, comma, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And those who don't obey the gospel. There will be people who don't know and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 9. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Verse 10. When he comes in that day and to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. Because our testimony among you was believed. And obey there. And what it means is... And to be obedient, if you look it up for obey, it means to be obedient to God, to submit to Him. It doesn't make you a legalist by being obedient to God. It means that you fear God in a reverent way, and He's holy. We have to treat God who He is. He's not your homie. You've got to go up and high-five Him and kick it with Him. No. That's a lie from the devil right there. God is holy. Everybody in the Bible, when they come before God, they fall on their knees and worship and put their head down, and they worship God because He's holy. Right? And you're not going to go stand next to him and say, yeah, God, they're all worshiping. No, we're going to worship him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Millions of angels before it, millions and millions. They're bowing down to him. So all of us need to treat God as he's holy and perfect and worthy of your praise and worship. Amen? Amen. So always remember that. We need to obey God. A lot of people don't like that word. It's a scary word. <clears throat> And the last word I've got was moral turpitude. What that means is it's, it's uh, in crimes that are like morally reprehensible. They're vile. They're, they're, uh, they're evil intent. People who do a lot of these don't have any good morals. It's like rape, molestation, uh, murder, mayhem, grand theft auto, selling drugs. Those are moral issues, right? Would you guys agree? Most people know when they're doing these crimes, and they have a conscience in them going, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing this. And why? They get caught, right? And of course, they were going to the job interview every time. But anyway, <laughs> when they do get caught, all of a sudden, they want what? Mercy. I want the mercy. Why can't you let me off? Judge, jury, Mr. Policeman or Deputy, why can't you let me off? Because this is the best thing for you, actually. Because our society needs this. We have to have this. And these are the laws, Right? So there are laws and rules. When you go to a job to start a job, do you have a policy of rules? 
that you have to sign an initial, you understand all your expectations? Well, God don't have you. He's going to do whatever you want, right? No. No. You follow God. You chase after God. You thirst for God. And yes, he will fill you with his righteousness and his holiness, not your own. But you're going to begin to change and want the things of God and his moral characters that you find in the Bible. And you're going to want to do those things to please him. Because you want to, not because you have to, because you want to. Amen. Big difference. Amen? Amen. So anyway, uh, all these things, that, it's like felonies and all those sort of things, that, like assaults and domestic violence and all those sort of things. But a lot of times that moral character issue, and those start when we're kids. Those things start when you're young, right? You start making bad decisions, man, you get away with stealing something. I think I've got a question on that too, don't get ahead of myself. What does the Bible say about stealing? Is that true? Does the Bible say that? Where's that at? Okay. Did you know there's one time in the Bible that and you can actually steal and not get kind of actually get away with it a little bit? Do you guys know that? If you're stealing food, listen up. And this is in uh, I've got ahead of myself. I want to show. Right, Exodus 25. Or 15 says, you shall not steal. But in Proverbs 6.30, men do not despise the thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger. Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold. He must give up all the wealth of his house. So there comes a time, man, you're in court, and then some guy got caught stealing a ham, not a hamburger, but some frozen meal, and he walks out. You don't want, you should, and you're not allowed to steal, right? There's a judgment on all this. But you have to consider everything. You have to consider it all. The facts to the case, right? And if all of us want to deal out a penalty and justice, then first look at yourself. Look in the mirror. Because a lot of you have done the same thing that you're condemning someone else for, right? <laughs> you don't like to admit that. That's true. A lot of you have done the same thing that you're pointing your fingers at for someone else, and you think it's not that big of a deal. Those who compare themselves among themselves are what? Foolish. That's foolish. We don't compare ourselves among ourselves. But God holds us accountable, right? Yeah. So as men, women, young men, young ladies, we're held accountable by God. We are held accountable. Yes, we can make mistakes. We can have accidents. Those things happen. But if you start to do things that are intentional, right? And if you're doing something because you want to do it and it's good for your flesh and you love it, you're practicing sin and loving it, and you're only going to get better at it, right? You're only going to get better at it. Right. But you have to stop it. And what repent means is to forsake it and walk away from it, and God will give you the strength on a new path. He will fill you with His Spirit. And He says to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Amen? Amen. So anyway, there's a lot of things that I have seen in the churches the last several years. And there's a lot of things I've seen in the world, in the cities and counties, and all these things. And we all want justice. But a lot of the people who are wanting justice are doing the same things they're pointing their fingers at. It doesn't make any sense to me. Remember that when you point one finger, it's three pointing back at you. You guys have heard that, right? Yeah. Anyway, whatever God loves, I love. Whatever he hates, I hate. Amen. Amen? Amen? I'll read that verse in a minute. Isaiah 520, chapter 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Verse 22, it says, Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drinks. Verse 23, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. Verse 24, is therefore as the fire devours the stubble, and the flame consumes the chaff, so the root will be as rottenness, and their blossom will ascend like dust. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. The word I'm looking at there is, and they take away the justice from the righteous person. And there's a lot of times the poor people get taken advantage of, do they not? They do, it's true. There's poor people who get taken advantage of. There is. Would you guys agree with that? They don't have an attorney they can't afford them. They have to use the one that's free. 
Hey, most of the free ones aren't that good, to be honest with you. They're not. I'm just being honest. But, uh, but not everybody's a victim. If we're in Christ, we're no longer a victim. Amen? Amen. We have a victory through Christ. We're conquerors through him. Yes. Amen? And a lot of people will walk around, I'm a victim. I'm all this. I'm all... Stop calling yourself a victim. You're not a victim. If you're in Christ, you're no longer a victim. Amen. Amen. Let's look at, uh, turn your Bibles to James 4. James chapter 4. Oh, my goodness, stuff. that's good. Yeah, mercy's mentioned in the Bible 170 times. And the word is elos, E-L-E-O-S, Strong's number 1656. And what it's defined as is by loyalty to God's covenant and compassion. This is loyalty to God's covenant and compassion. If you're in God's covenant, he's going to have compassion for you. If you're in God's covenant. And what's his covenant? By faith, you're justified by faith through grace, right? And turn your Bibles there really quick. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 just really quick. Sorry, we'll turn right back to that in a second. Just hold your spot. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Did you hear that? But everybody always skips number 10. Have you guys read number 10? Let's keep reading in context. For we are his workmanship and created in Christ Jesus for good works. If Christ is in you, a byproduct of Christ is going to be good works in your life. You're going to see them. That's a byproduct of Christ. Right? right? right. For we are his workmanship and created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. Amen? Amen? And so a lot of times, if you ever hear a pastor read that, he won't read number 10. Make sure he reads the whole passage. I'm just being straight with you. All right, back to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. It's like looking around this room. and Inside this room, there's amazing testimonies. Yeah. We had a guy that was in the cartel, and we had another guy who was a, a big gangster from back in the day. And we have all kinds of people in here who God has taken and shaken them and they're Jesus freaks now. It's amazing. But it's only through the truth of God, man. There's nothing fake about it. It's true. And we see a lot of miracles happen all the time with these folks. Because they're walking with God in truth. We can only worship in spirit and truth, right? It's John 4, 24. The Bible is truth. And people's opinions aren't truth. Let's look at uh, or James 4, 17. It says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Right? If you know to do good and you don't do it, that's a sin. That's a sin. If you know to do good and what you're doing is wrong, and you know it, most of us do. Most of us know we're doing something wrong unless something's wrong with us, our mind, or something else. But if we know to do and do good and don't do it, it's sin in God's eyes. That's James 4. That's New Testament. Amos chapter 5. Turn your Bibles there. Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5. That's Old Testament. Amos chapter 5. We had some great worship tonight. For those who got here a little bit late, really good worship. Amos chapter 5. Yeah, uh, I was tired actually. It's like it was about 45 minutes maybe. Like normally we don't go that long, but it was a while. I was like, man, I'm tired tonight. But it was good though. I thought it was a good worship. I felt the Holy Spirit really strong tonight. Amos chapter 5, verse 14. It says, seek good and not evil that you may live. So the Lord, God of hosts, will be with you. As you have spoken, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. We're supposed to hate evil. Yeah. We don't embrace evil and say, hey, that's cool, no biggie. We're supposed to hate evil. We're not supposed to embrace it. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. And so many times, man, if we could just... Step out of our comfort zone a little bit. 
Share your testimony with somebody how bad you used to be. We have to be transparent with our past life, do we not? And if we're afraid to share who we used to be, we're still there. If we're afraid of people judging us, you haven't been forgiven then. You haven't met him yet. Once you meet him, you know you're forgiven. You're like, I don't care what you guys think about me. I'm going to share the truth with you and who I used to be when I came from. Amen. But so many people are so afraid of sharing their testimony because they, and they're afraid people will judge them. I don't care what people think, and they're not my Savior. And they're getting my joy. He did. Amen? Amen. And we have to keep our focus on Christ and lift him up. And so all men will be drawn to him, not yourself. Yes, we can share our testimony, but we're boasting in Christ. Amen? So hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious men to the remnant of Joseph. I've got in here uh, accountability, responsibility, and ownership. How many of you got a spanking when you were kids? My wife never got one. See? <laughs> she admits it. She never got it. <laughs> My wife admits it, but she never got a single spanking. So anyway, a lot of kids who have never been corrected, what happens? Well, it hurts. <laughs> it's rough, man. Let me tell you. It's rough. Because nobody grows up perfect, do they? So accountability, responsibility, and ownership, right? So parents, children, when you're on the job, you're in church, you're in school, and it says in Colossians 3.20, children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Did you hear that? Amen. Children, obey your parents. Oh, I don't have to. That's what God says, man. God's right, you're wrong. Proverbs 29, 15. It says, The rot and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Did you hear that? Don't you dare shame me. That's God's word. There's nothing wrong with correcting your kids. Don't beat them, but you can correct your children. There's nothing wrong with that. I know society tells you something different. Look at society now. What happened? You can't arrest me. You're not taking me to jail for and burning down a building or knocking out the windows, you're not doing nothing about it, right? 20 years ago, they would have gone to jail. Not now. Why? Quit doing that. Proverbs 22.6 says, All right, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, right? If you train up a child in the way they should go. But a lot of times, people don't train up in the child in the way they should go. They let them do whatever they want. Yes, love them, encourage them, strengthen them. But don't raise a little monster. Because if all your neighbors are telling you, hey, and your kid's out of control, or this is going on, oh, she's pointing at her brother over here. <laughs> I'd have to ask the parents. Anyway, I had three sons. And my oldest son, Cody, is a pastor. I'll tell you what, he was the hardest out of all the kids. Mitchell, and I probably spanked him three times his whole life. You guys all know Mitchell, he's not here tonight. He knows. But he's very dramatic. He would fall down and squeal, lay there for several hours and tweak his leg. But Cody, man, I could correct. In five minutes, he was back and we were good to go. Huh? He wrote ripple in your leg. Yeah, he was, yeah. He's done that. He's done that. But all my sons, glory to God, turned out pretty good. They've never been to jail, never been arrested. All of them have done good for themselves. And yes, at times, man, they may have thought I was like Daddy Dearest. But I love my sons. I love my boys. I love my grandchildren. And yes, I want to raise them up in the Lord, in love, in nurturing, all those good things. But at the same time, I want to be honest with them. I want them to grow. You know, someday they're going to be out there without me. And I want them to make good decisions when I'm not around. Amen? Amen. Right. How do children learn godly justice at home and church? By watching their examples. Right, who's their product? All the parents. Who all has kids in here? I got grandkids. Who else has kids? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Adults, here we go. Let's see here. Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Was I the best parent in the world? No, I was. I'll admit to it. I made mistakes. I made many mistakes. 
you know, at one time, we were at football practice, and I was a football coach for Cody's team, and he was a quarterback. And he was actually a really good quarterback. But anyway, he was probably in the seventh grade, but all those kids at that time had bad mouths, and, you know, and profanity was bad. And so one time I set the whole team down and said, hey man, if you guys are gonna cuss, you're out of here. And later that day, when Cody's at practice, he shouts out profanity, and I said, see ya. He's all, you're my dad. I said, start walking home. It's about a mile away, maybe a mile. <laughs> he got his pads and he left. But if I wouldn't have done that, then the rest of the team would have been right. It's not right, right? Right? And so hold your family accountable. Hold them accountable. You're not doing them a favor by lying to them. Don't be an enabler for people, man. Tell them the truth. And if you expect something, expectations, tell them. This is right, this is wrong. And these are the reasons why, and God says so. It's out of love. That's justice. And so someday when they grow up, and then the court shows them mercy, they're going to recognize. Man, I was looking at six years for manslaughter, but the judge only gave me probation. That's mercy. You're not going to walk back out and go do the same thing. You recognize that God gave you mercy. If you recognize what mercy is from a young age, you're growing up in it. They'll recognize what mercy is. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. You guys there? It says, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Or this is for men here. O man of God, pursue righteousness. Men, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about to which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And all of us, of course, went down to the altar when you first got saved. I was 40 and I'm 53 now. 13 years ago, I got saved. And prior to that, I went to church. I mean, I did the same thing on weekends. But I was never changed in here until I got filled with the Holy Spirit almost 11 years ago. Prior to that, I, I mean, I'd gone to the altar. I was still going to church, but I had a bar at home getting drunk on weekends. Right? Until the pastor came on. We snuck it outside and put it in the garage. Everybody's coming for a barbecue. I was like, man, they're going to see all my stuff. Wow. I was living a lie. I was living a lie. Man, drunkards <laughs> going into heaven, the Bible says. Drunkards in Galatians and 1 Corinthians 6, 19, don't enter heaven. If you're a drunkard, if you're drunk when the Lord returns back, sorry, Charlie. <laughs> it says to be sober-minded. You won't get in. Sorry. Okay, pursue what? Righteousness? And what is righteousness? And what does it mean? Right. It means justice, actually, when you look it up, it means justice. Justness, righteousness, which God is the source of the author. It means integrity. We have to have integrity as men, do we not? And women as well. We have to have integrity. When no one's watching, you have to make the right decision. Just because people aren't there watching, well, no one's going to know about this. I'm going to lie or hide this. And that's not of God. That isn't of God, folks. And I'll get forgiven later for this, right? right? That's not justice. That isn't justice. That's sin. Verse 13. It says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession and to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And free from reproach, that means your life. If somebody finds out anything about your life, then it'll be all about Christ. It's not going to be something else in your life that was hidden, no one knew about, you were caught up in all the sin, and everything was a big lie, right? Have you guys seen that happen? Yes. Instead of coming to the altar and her brothers and sisters reaching out saying, hey, I've got a weakness, man. Here it is right here, man. Would you guys pray with me? I need help. As brothers and sisters, we do want, we call each other out. We do, hey man, you need help in this area, man. You're making a big mistake. That's your wife. Don't be out doing this, man. That's not Christian life. I'm calling you out, man. You're not a Christ if you're doing adultery. You're a liar. You're whole, right? Call them out. You call them out? It's not, hey, you deserve this, man. She's really mean to you. You deserve, no. That's the world. That's the world. Don't listen to the world. The world will lie to you and please your flesh. Ladies, Proverbs 19.14. Turn your Bibles there if you would. Proverbs 19, 14. <coughs> Proverbs.
Proverbs 19.14. It says, House and wealth are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife is from the Lord. What does that mean? And she shows good judgment. She's careful in her actions. And she's careful in what she does with what she's got. She's prudent with it. And she's not out of control and doing all this crazy stuff. She's prudent. That's God's word. It's Proverbs 19, 14. Well, let's look at Proverbs 14, 1. This is on Danny's wall at home. It says, The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish one pulls it down with her hands. And ladies, did you hear that? And it's true, man. Only a woman can build a home. It's true. And a woman can show up at a house and she can come in and put up pictures and carpet and all the stuff or tile flooring. They can come in and actually make it a house. Guys, we're just kind of like, we just need a chair. A chair and a TV and a fridge. We're cool, right? Right? <laughs> One set of clothes. We'll make it. But women come in and bring that nurturing, that love. That's what they're made for. The Lord made them that way. And they're amazing at it. But it says a woman, the wise woman, builds her house. But the foolish woman, then she pulls it down with her hands. Is that possible? Have you guys seen that? I mean, go to divorce court and you'll see what happens. <laughs> That's a madness. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 13. I'm almost done. 2 Corinthians 13. So justice. Justice is knowing right from wrong and making good decisions of what you have, right? And sometimes we don't have all the facts. If you don't have all the facts, don't make an assumption what someone else said or done if you weren't there, right? And a lot of times people get themselves in trouble by saying or believing what might have happened. And they build themselves up and get all worked up over nonsense, right? So make sure you know both sides. <laughs> and if it has nothing to do with you, do you want Stay out of it. But if your brother or sister says, I need some help, and they're saying, hey, I'm caught up in all this, and you know, go in and go, you need to tell the truth and make it right. Well, that's not going to work out. That'll make me look bad. Yeah, but it'll make you look good in front of him, though, because he loves you. I'm not sure if I'm going to do that. All right, man. Do what you're going to do. And you're going to fall hard with consequences. Right? That happens. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. And that means look in the mirror at all your blind spots. Man, is there something there that I'm doing that I can change? Be honest with yourself. Most people do what? I got nothing wrong with me. It's people around me have all the problems. And have you guys met someone who has issues with everybody around them? But they don't see it? They got problems with everybody every day. There's just an issue, an issue, an issue, an issue, an issue. It's time to put on the brakes, pump the brakes, and go. Maybe I'm the problem. Maybe it's this thing right here, this tongue in my mouth that won't shut up. Maybe I just need to be quiet for a day and just listen, huh? Right? What? <laughs> you know, it's why the Lord gave you two ears and one tongue. And so you listen a lot more than you speak. It's true. <laughs> Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. And do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. And so honestly look in the mirror. Is Christ living in you? Is Christ actually living inside of you? Test yourself. Are you? I'm not saying go out and commit a sin. But I'm saying is Christ truly living in you? You know it or not. All of us deep down know in here whether or not we're living for Christ. We know it. We can't fake it with him. We know it. For the school teachers. For the kids. And the kids are tested, right? They're tested to find out whether or not they're learning in the class with the teacher's teaching, right? That's going on. And little Jimmy, or Cody, I'll use Cody all of a sudden. One time, I think it was sixth grade or fifth grade? Sixth grade. Miss Dickey's class, is that what it was? Uh, I think that was it. I'm going to give him up. Anyway, <laughs> we show up to class. Teacher Perry Crawford's walked in, and we sat down, we're kind of excited. They've been doing his homework, part of it, I guess. We walked in, he had straight ups every single class. She never called us one time. We walked in and sat down, I'm like, straight F's the monkey could have said here with a hat on and got the same grade. I was like, what are you doing in class? <laughs> Hanging out with my friends. So, of course, he went home, he got everything taken away. I think I even spanked him. And I may have taken him out of his sports team at the time, too. I'm not sure if it was baseball one of them, I took him out of it. He was upset. But there had to be a correction. 
And of course, the next quarter, we were sending something home every single day. Was his homework getting done? And like the next time, he made an arm. Wow. But there has to be that. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to find out whether they're doing it. When you start a new job, what happens? You show up on the new job the first day, you don't know anything, man. They give you this deal or expectations, you're on probation, there's reviews, right? All those things going on. Whether or not you're learning how to do the job. It's the same thing in church, man. If I'm watching somebody after five years and they're still showing up drunk, I'm going to be like, dude, what are you doing here? Yeah. You've been coming to the door five years and you're still drunk, man. Are you not listening to the sermons and the messages? What's going on? Well, the coffee's really good here. <laughs> well, dude, that ain't helping you, man. You need a break. You need to be broken inside of here. The fastest way to Jesus is being broken in your heart and getting on your knees and crying out. I was going to kill myself 13 years ago through stress. I remember crying out to God, and he came in. The love I was looking for was him. It was God. But some people never get broken enough, I guess, to come to that place of complete humility, and you fall on your face and cry out to God. It has to happen. It has to happen sooner or later. Everybody gets a shot. Amen? So the Lord has expectations of us, does he not? He does. You're going to produce fruit in your life. And there's going to be things about you that are different from the world. You're going to be able to tell the difference. If you're standing next to yourself and someone in the world, you, you guys will be completely different. And there's going to be things in the world you're like, I'm not being part of that. That's not of God. I'm not going to do it. And I'm not going to be all caught up in all this other stuff anymore. I'm not part of that anymore. I just want to hang out with them and proselytize them. But no, you don't. It's going to rub off on you. Right? Yeah. Bad company corrupts good morals. The Bible says that. So be careful who you hang out with because then something's going to happen. One of the two things are going to happen. They're going to rub off on you or you're going to rub off on them. But if you're hanging out with them and there are things that are wrong, they're rubbing off on you. If they're coming to church with you, sitting down doing Bible studies, that's even better. <clears throat> so are you growing in Christ? Is your faith growing? Is your thirst for Scripture? Who has a thirst for Scripture in here? That's where it's at, is digging through this Word. <laughs> And the Word of God jumps off the pages. When you're reading it, the Holy Spirit will light you up. You'll get to some passages. Man, I'm talking, you get renewed, man. For days, you'll be digging through that one passage. It's amazing. And the Lord teaches. The Holy Spirit teaches you. He's the teacher. Are you stagnant? Have you guys ever gotten stagnant in your walk with God a little bit? Yeah. You find other things to do or something else that takes your attention and the devil does want he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We submit to God, right? Resist the devil if we promise. If we, for me, I always need structure. I was brought up in structure. I like, my mom was like a drill sergeant. So the bed was made, everything, you know, every day. <laughs> Dishes, I had a list, everything. And that helped me out, actually, with structure. It was good. For me, I needed structure. You know, uh, but you have to have, and I'm not saying at a certain time, read your Bible. But you need a thirst inside of you. You better have that thirst. If you don't, then seek God's face some more. Press it some more and say, Lord God, I want to find you. And Father, you said, if I seek you, I will find you. With all my heart, I'll find you. So you have to seek God with all that you are. But if you find something else a little bit better than God, well, that looks pretty good. That drink over there, or these drugs look good. And look at that dude over there. He's pretty hot in his pants. All these other things are going on. If you don't keep your heart and your eyes on Christ... All these other things will make you fall away. You've got to keep your eyes on Christ, on the prize. He's the prize, right? Amen. He's the prize. It's nothing else. And so righteousness in Christ, man, should be seen in us. If we want justice in our communities, in our schools, in our courts, in our cities, in our counties, in our states, it starts inside of our walls, right? It starts in you. If you start living a life in Christ and hating evil and loving good, and not being afraid to point it out, or showing mercy after knowing what True justice is. True justice is acknowledging the penalty that Christ paid for you, or letting your life be the proof of your faith in Him. That's true justice. If you acknowledge what Christ did for you, your life's going to be changed. And those forgiven much love much. When you've been forgiven, you recognize the forgiveness, and oh man, you forgive everybody. Why? Because you've been forgiven, and you recognize He forgave you for all the vile things you did. Thank you, Lord. Not one person in this room is righteous, right? Right? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death, right? Uh, I 
Turn your Bibles to, this is the last verse, to Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. Brother Cody, did you want to say anything, son? Whoever's phone line is, would you shut it off, please? Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. You guys there? Hebrews 11.6. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, yes. and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Right? Yes. So if you seek God, what's the byproduct? Integrity, holiness, Righteousness, good decisions, all the time. No, you can fall. But if you're living in Christ, then your life's going to be changed. You're going to be able to see true change in your life living in Jesus. It's going to be true. And yes, we have a lot of people who are fakes. And they hurt the rest of us who are walking with Christ. It's true. And I've had a lot of people, I don't want to know Jesus. My wife said she knew Christ and was doing all this other stuff. Well, she was lying. But there has to be a true change in your life. There's got to be a true change. And you will see it. Cody? 517? What? It's 1 Corinthians 517, is that it? 2 Corinthians. What is it? What's it saying? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Amen. Old is gone, behold, the new is come. Come on, Cody. It's all yours, buddy. 